So anyway, she's like had this conversation with this Dr. Stephen Greer guy, which I, again, I don't really know who this guy is at all, but he's a guy that heavily advocates us contacting extraterrestrials. And she was basically oh, yeah. like, she was like, yeah, they're not aliens. They're, they're extraterrestrials. That's actually racist to say. Did you say the word racist? He did. He said that it's it's racist to call them aliens. Wouldn't it be spe- speciesist? speciesist? <laughs> I don't know if it was the St. Nectarios oil or something this morning, but I was like going through some stuff for like 45 minutes. And then like, okay, and then this is the mind-blowing thing. I couldn't think of a way to text this. I was trying to look up Orthodox stuff when this ad came on, on YouTube about the aliens. Like I was trying to look up, like there's like an Orthodox meme thing. I was trying to, oh. that's what I'm saying. And then like, not too long before that, the metaverse, there's like a thing about like these people walking into a painting. And I was like, welcome to the dimension of creativity. And it like struck me so hard. It's like, it fathers, like the thoughts of what is happening right now are absolutely correct because they have to reintroduce magic, but they have to do it under the guise of technology. And I was just like, like for like an hour, I was just sitting there completely lost. Like, anyway, yeah, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sure this is probably. I mean, is it? Is it, could we maybe call it neo alchemy? <laughs> like, are they maybe? Because yeah. a lot of these alchemists, like the way that they were making their bread, you know, was they were convincing. They were like early science, what, and they were like, you know, using all these they didn't call it science, but they're using all these material terms They're we're going to change this me- material to this metal, this, this material to this. But when you go and you look at these alchemists and what they like D and all of these other ones, man, they were straight up conjuring demons, mm-hmm. like D. straight, especially D <laughs> straight up mystics, the whole nine, they didn't convert nothing to nothing. It was all code. <laughs> for all of the demon stuff that they were doing. You get into it, they start talking about, they call them the profane, what they call them, like the, the gold changers, the gold makers. There's like, mm. there's like a pejorative term for them. Cause mm-hmm. we're like, yeah, these basically these hucksters trying to turn lead to gold. It's like, it's the deep meaning, you know, mm-hmm. of the hidden things. And yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. Cause at the same time, a guy like Greer, where it's like, yeah, we're talking about aliens, kind of, but we started getting into like them trying to contact them through meditation and this intersection mm-hmm. of spirituality. It's like, I, you know, like what's he really think? You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. the the cell that of was it, kind of like my whole point is, it was right. like this dude is much more. By the way, I don't know what's going on. Maybe, but hi, welcome to Royal Path. We might already be in it. I'm not sure. It depends. <laughs> we'll talk about it. That's kind of what I was saying is because and it was like showing some of the pictures and stuff and like it was hard not to look at like yeah it's photoshopped it's probably fake whatever you can call it a type of iconography I suppose even if it is like photoshopped in a fake picture of like these like encounters they've had with these like like splotched red little red and gray things and it's like they're like you can do this. I'm like, I don't really want to though. Like that doesn't look like anything I want contact with. Like during this. Who does? That's the question. You know? Well, that gets us back to, if you guys remember what it's like to be in an altered state. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing is being in the, that's one of the big problems of the altered state is that the inhibitions that are given to us are there for a reason. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right and when some of those inhibitions drop down it's like something which if you were in your right mind you'd be like this is not good 
all of a sudden it's like that sounds like a wonderful idea i don't know what this thing is but rad dude yeah you know i mean that's Mm. it, it, it all goes hand in the hand you know and it's it's that it's false light it's that darkness of the worst kind because it's super seductive when you're in it but when you get pulled out of it you're like lord have mercy like Mm-hmm. what was i thinking <laughs> you know it's just you look at that stuff it's just it's it's atrocious but mm-hmm. it shows how dark everything is right now actually i think because like i haven't even i'm slipping out of the world more and more it's like i barely know anything about the metaverse i, I haven't bothered to look up oh, yeah. any of the commercials but some of the screenshots i saw i was like what is this like this doesn't even look good like Mm -hmm. and and those are and those are the not the actual metaverse that's like they made a cgi demo of something and you're like this already looks horrible i have no desire to live my life inside this poorly rendered video game like what are you doing here that's exactly what it looks like a poorly rendered video game that's exactly poorly rendered video game and like a poorly rendered video game that takes itself seriously. That's like actually trying to be yes. cool. Yes. It's the the fact that, and you know that they've done focus groups and all kinds of stuff. And people were like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm into, I'm into that. Oh yeah, I would definitely, I would spend 20 hours a day. And you're like, how bad is, how bad are things for you? You think Mark's a lot of weed, man. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm not sure Mark Zuckerberg focus groups anything. I think he's just like, this is it. You're going to have it. And like, we will. Like, he's just like, no, this is what you're going to get. And you're not I like, I don't need to make this appealing. I don't need to do anything. I just need to get it in there. You're going to take it no matter what. So it's like, good luck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, maybe I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a, a, a great segue into what, where where we're at in the creed today but i think that there is something about about mystery and not understanding and not well i mean so where are we we're at um uh one lord jesus christ son of god the only begotten begotten of the father before all ages light of light mm-hmm. true god of true god mm-hmm. begotten not made of one essence with the father by whom all things were made. The mm-hmm. light of light, true God of true God, mm-hmm. tripped me up for a long time contemplating what was going on there. So I, because the, this is the, this is a mystery, right, Father? This, this one is the mystery or a, one of them, one of many among them. But tell me if I, tell me if I, I have this correct in terms of what's trying to be, be said there at, at a high level, that it's, that it's not a process of creation, but that it's, there's a, there's a sameness and a separateness of, of the same time. Light coming from out of light, mm-hmm. true God coming from out of true God. That to me is like just one of those, you sit there and you think about it and you're- Sameness, you're, but distinction. Sameness, yeah. but distinction. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sameness, but distinction. Yeah. Um, you know, context out of the way a big part of that and that language which people um especially nowadays feels is like really redundant is the fact that um the the church and the fathers the the revelation of christ was just it was simply that revelation and not simply you know the kind of dan brown conspiracy theory that people think it is in regards to the nicene creed and the church fathers and and what they're what they're dealing with is, you know, the early conspiracies of Gnostics, um, various Gnostic sects, pagans, and and everyone else who's trying to kind of horn in on on the life of the church as the church is beginning to grow and to um, ascend. Not so much in political power as we would understand it, but kind of awareness within the empire, you know, the threat of, of the church is, is looming um, to these, these sects and these cults. So um, what the church is dealing with is, are these heretical ideas of, you know, like Arianism, Christ is, you know, this created creature, 
you know, the greatest of them all, but still a creature and not quite God. And so it's really that, just to get that out of the way, is it's important to understand that what the church is trying to um, emphasize there, light of light, true God of true God, you know, begotten, not made, one essence is, is the absolute divinity of Jesus Christ, that he wasn't a kind of mode of, of God. He wasn't this um, kind of apparition, all, all the different ways that people want to cut it. He wasn't like an angel, wasn't a demigod. All that. He was like God who created all things. Um, and it's so- like a mic drop, isn't it? I never realized. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really like a mic drop. It's really like a period. It's really like, we're done. Like, it's not even around, we're not even having this conversation anymore. Like that, <laughs> like, like we're done, you know? But that being said, there's, I mean, there's so much to go into that, especially with the light of light part, because uh, I mean, think about how much, how much uh, in the scriptures light is referenced, you know, and the light of the world, he who falls after me will not, will no longer walk in darkness. Um, you know, the light perceived, the light comes in the world. Was it in fact in John, um, the darkness perceived it not, you know, um, there's this really incredible verse in Daniel. I actually pulled it up here because I was like, oh, this is really good. I want to share it. It's in Daniel. It says, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. It's in Daniel too. So in both the Old and New Testament, I mean, <laughs> God said, let there be light, right? I mean, we can go on and on and beginning to understand, you know, what light is and, and how we you know, meaning there, there's so much there. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, there's a reality to where it's beyond just metaphor, right? That there's, that it is actually, um, a, I mean, light is a revelation. It's, and, and so, it's even a mystery to the materialists. Like, I mean, that's quantum physics, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, is it a wave? Is it a particle? Like, yeah, both <laughs> ends, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so I think the thing is with, with that is that um, for me, I mean, for me in this context, what I'm really, I'm wanting to kind of point to people too, because uh, it's easier to talk about, to be honest with you, is that um, false light and understanding that the, the light of light, which is Christ and Christ is the revelation of the father um, and the spirit, and I mean, the Trinity, the Godhead, he is a revelation of it. Like these things, um, you know, they're ineffable and they become beyond our being able to kind of chat it up. But something that we can definitely chat chat up is um, the false light. And I think, you know, we are talking about, you know, the SETI project. I don't even know that if that's what he's still doing with Greer and everything, you know, not to get on the personal attack, but um this false light that people um are so willing to you know open themselves up to it's so interesting because um when i think of light you know light of light in christ and, and that scripture especially you know i'm the light of the world and he falls after me will not walk in darkness this this understanding of him being the light of the world and in the light of christ we really understand what it means to be um, human, what it means to be alive, what it means to be, ex what, it, what it means to be, what it means to be, you know, like period, <laughs> like what it means to be, um, that that's who Christ is. And it's so fascinating to me when I try to reflect on those honest moments in my life when um, I was so engulfed in false light and this sense of um, if you've been there, you know what I mean? It's, it's the arrogance that comes. It's like the delusion that you're in, um, the, the ability to look at something, which when you're sober, you know, literally or metaphorically, it, it's, it's the most absurd thing. But at the moment, you just feel like this thing is, I've got the secret, man. And it, and it, I think that's the thing that I'm, I, I trip out on is that 
everybody's got the secret now, but no one's earned it. Sure. Everyone's got, you know what I mean? Everyone's got the secret now, but no one's, um, no one's put the time in and no one, it's like, not in the sense of how the Gnostics would see it, like, you know, we have the keys to secret knowledge, but it is like, you know, someone can watch, someone can watch our, watch this show, podcast, whatever, and they can be like, oh yeah, Andrew, blah, blah, blah. And they can go on and on and on, like they know Andrew. But at the end of the day, it's like, they may know you, but that that knowledge of you is is at a qualitatively different level. And I think that's what, I wanna say that because when, when we talk about knowing God and knowing the true light versus the false light and this idea that, you know, I can just, I can understand God, know God, just like anybody else can. It's like, that's, that's I think, where a lot of people get, get stumbled upon because um, the church says that there are, there are things that are necessary to approach God, namely purification, right? And this purification, the process of it brings forth light, illumination. And this illumination brings forth all the things that people are, are looking for in all the things that, that really the false light is selling these days, you know, understanding, um, kind of, you know, the omniscience, all this crazy stuff that the world feels like it's, it can give you via what technology. You, What's what, that? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was about to ask, what, what, what are you referencing in particular, but you were getting ready to say in technology? Yeah, um, omniscience. You know, you can, you can see all things. You can live I forever. Mean, What's that? You can live forever. You can live forever. You can live forever. All, all these things are like when, when we say it like this, it just sounds so ludicrous and over the top um, being hyperbolic. But at the same time, when you really start breaking it down, people's sense of mortality is all but out the window now, which is really weird because even in the light of, um, hmm. Huh. you know the pandemic and all, and all that stuff it's like but i think that but i've said from the beginning father that like it is the warping of the sense of mortality particularly among the baby boomers mm -hmm. that is that i believe is why this was able to take place mm -hmm. and is the reason why they'll be like oh yes you know it was two weeks to save grandma mm -hmm. and it's like really, at the at really the cost quick. of i'm so sorry what do you mean what do you mean? Like, what, what was your thought on that? So, so basically what I said was it, from the very beginning, like day one, March, 2020, I said, look, you want to understand what the virus is? Here's the virus. The baby boomers were raised to believe they were raised to believe in the Jetsons, the vision of the Jetsons future. They okay. would have flying cars and that they would live forever. And that basically what's happening now is they're starting to die. And that they're seeing that and it's the cognitive dissonance for them because they were told you're never going to die because by the time you're old enough for that to happen, we will have, whether it was explicit or implicit, but it's like the popular science, the comic books, the Jetsons, like yeah. you name it, right? A science fiction mm -hmm. of in the seventies, right? When they were adults, like all of these things and then being told like, oh yeah, we will have conquered death in 20 years, like 20 years, 30 years from now, we'll be flying in these cars, you know, all of these predictions, right? And they hit that time and they're like, oh no, 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 no. We need more time. This is what I felt going underneath it. Like, as I was talking to my mom and people around her and her generation and all of that, it was like, no, 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 no. Everything is supposed to be curable. Like death mm -hmm. should be able to be handled by modern medicine. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, okay, stop us from dying. This thing's going to kill us here. Stop us from dying. And it was like, okay, at the cost of your children and their children, mm -hmm. give us your children's livelihood and give us your grandchildren's sanity and health, mm -hmm. right? Give all of that to us. And then we will make you think that you're going to work that, that we can continue the project of you living forever. And huh. it's like, that's what I see. That's everything. To me, that's been, that's been it from the very beginning. And it's, I had never put, I hadn't put it together that it's like, well, that's the plan. That's the false light. Like eternal. It's like, yes, eternal life. You're going to get eternal life. 
but it's like, it, but it's the junk food. It's the junk food eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. And like, <clears throat> so specifically targeted at a specific age group of the people that we needed to save and everything. I, I, th I mean, I, th I don't know, like, well, yeah, it was targeted at them because look at the age of the world leaders, right? So they're all in that age group, okay. right? all, the, all the people who would make the decisions. But I think that it's just like, up, like I would like father to continue because I do think that it's, yeah, it's obviously yeah, right. part of a lot. It's like a much older, it's a project that's been going on for a long time, you know, sure. what I mean? and it's, and it's a demonic project. Like it's I'm not like, even like a elite, elite project. So I, I'm sure that there's a really easy way to um, answer this father and, but you know, humor me um, as a person who has fallen into heavy deception before um, uh, that how what's like, I, I know like my specific, some of the specific indicators I'm getting ready to fall into deception or at least the ones I'm familiar with. Is there like a practical and visceral, like kind of like tangible way to kind of like gauge where you're heading? And of course it's prayer, but I mean, like even then I can fall into deception then as well. But like, is there like some things we should be looking out for like specific because i mean obviously if it's not with humility that probably ain't good if it's like if you're like oh i knew i was right like i know that that's probably not good like the things i thought would work are getting me to god instead of like this like humbleness and repentance crap like um and then i know that like also one is when i feel so good when i'm like kind of bopping so hard about stuff i'm mm -hmm. forgetting god it's and then like that one little chink in my armor is enough to just be uh he knows what you're doing you don't have to think about him right now like and then it's like before i know it like a couple hours have gone by and it's like oh you don't really need to worry about prayer he knows you're too busy right now to pray and he's blessing your work and then it's like and then then logical progression all i have to do is works and not faith like that's all i have to do so father how do you avoid deception like that like what uh, I'm talking about, like my deception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, forgive me because the things I'm trying to think. It's because Supreme hit on something, and I, oh, it's been so long since I read it. But there was a king, I think it's the Second Kings, who basically pulled that boomer move. He was just like, you know what? Spare me, but take my kids. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to think. I'm gonna have like at some point in time when you guys are rapping. I'm gonna. I'm gonna jump. Were you on looking it, it up? Yeah, and try to look it up because I it just as soon as he said that, I was like, yeah, that's like that one king. And he that's where he was like, yeah. But be it. honest, Father, if you managed to find that online, would you have owned up that you had got it off your phone? Or would yeah. you have been like, oh, okay. I thought you'd have been like, oh yeah, it's yeah, it's totally yeah, yeah. no, no. Because <laughs> I mean, no. I, I don't know. No, no, no. Believe me, because it's either that, it's kind of like, you know, you you hear the people clacking on the kick, tick, 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 tick. oh yeah <laughs> it's like i know you're looking it up man it's all good yeah. you know what i mean we're, none of us are mindats um <laughs> not yet not yet not yet so yeah i guess i guess the thing i want to say just about that self-deception is like one thing that's really simple to do but it's not easy is just realize that if you're comfortable something's wrong um <laughs> Because there's there's this space in which the the comfortability that I'm talking about is that kind of you know uh, complacency that that kind of like oh the, the excuse making I mean anytime excuses are made you know excuses made in sin I mean that's never good but I I think pulling back on it. A, a bigger thing is the way that we start to make excuses for what we take inside of us. Um, whether it is, you know, not so much something passive, like, oh, like, you know, I'm playing this video game, whatever, but there's certain ideas, ideologies, there's certain behaviors that we will begin to um, like give a nod to and just be like, oh, it's, it's kind of like not that big of a deal, you know? um 
And, and those are the things that I think are really pernicious because not only does it take, it's like the frog in the boiling pot, but more importantly, when you do wake up from those things, those are the ones that oftentimes are the hardest to really repent of because they begin to feel like it was your idea in the first place, right? And it's very hard to, to let go of something. It's one thing like if, if, if someone deceives me, my pride in some way can shake me out. I was like, oh, you got me. Like, and you're mad about it. But there's something about the kind of self-deception, which is really tough. Very few people get mad at themselves. We're like, I can't believe I really did that. People get mad at themselves in a, in a vain way. They're like, I'm better than this. I can't believe I did this. Yeah. Very few people will actually be like, you know, like the saints, you know, like, oh, gosh, Lord have mercy. I can't believe I've really done this. You know, I can't believe I've really, you know, sunk so low to actually think blah, 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 you know? Yeah, they're the kind of things that people, I don't know, everything from being unfaithful to their spouse, you know what I mean, to... Um, well, Father, I've got, I've got one, just because this is today, so this is ringing off for My me. kids will be okay. They don't, need, they don't need time with me today, you know what I mean? Like, you just go and... Anyways... I, I, I've, and I, I, I'm noticing now this among kind of probably some of the people listening, but like the cohort of people that let's say I've, I've spent a lot of time around ideologically for the last several, probably the last decade. And I found myself doing this, uh, actually this morning. And it was the first time that I had ever like caught myself on this and even recognized that I did it. And it was a, an interest, kind of a, one of these like weird experiences. And so it's interesting that you're, you're bringing it up now. Um, and I had a, man, I, whew, I had a strong instinct to do that exact thing and be like, ah, no, it's ex excuse. But it was basically, it's basically, you know, for so much of my life. And I mean, I think you could, people could look at the way that, that, the public end of my life and see that this is probably the way that things have worked out. I've been a very conniving person. Like that's, I, I'm not trying to like put a, like some sort of a like positive or negative, but I'm just saying like in the way of like calculating strategic when it came to other people trying to get one up on somebody, like yeah. before they were able to get one up on me, all of these things, like moving and manipulating situations to my advantage way before anyone knew that I was doing that thing. And it was only this morning that I realized that it's like, it's a, like it would be whenever I would be in a situation where I felt a, a, a level of insecurity about the world around me. Like you're saying that, that discomfort, right? It's where I'd be like, ooh, I see where this one's going. No, I better get out in front of that. And I had always viewed it as like, this is positive. Like you're so good at this. This is good. Look at how, how you, how you're able to like, orchestrate your life in this way and look at that and it was interesting because it was this morning in the car coming back from the beach from prayer and my mind started to like just totally unconscious right like i'm just going like oh here's this issue and it's like my mind starts spiraling the the stratagem you know what i mean oh mm -hmm. i can do this and I, oh okay and i'm start playing out the th the things and then it was like that is a lot what just the voice was like that's a lack of faith buddy Mm -hmm. like you know that's mm -hmm. that's a lack of faith mm -hmm. that's 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 mm -hmm. not you can't handle this mm -hmm. you know what i mean and like no yeah. matter how you how, no matter how you spin this thing out you're going to you know where that leads and i was like what yeah i just yeah. want everybody to know right now i'm trying very hard to be quiet because this is a subject i'm very interested in and i don't want to subject you guys like for the next like 15 to 20 minutes on my like thoughts about this exact subject that I'm so extremely passionate about, like people's defense mechanisms. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah I mean, I had never known that was one of mine, by the way. It's I, had all, I, had, I had thought until this morning, I had thought that that was one of my greatest qualities. And now I'm realizing that is one of my greatest weaknesses. Well, you I mean, I'm, forgive me. I just want to say this because this is the thing. When you get closer to God, there's more light. Like the true light exposes you. Mm -hmm. 
and you, you begin to see blemishes and you begin to see rot and you get, you begin to see things that you, you thought were, you literally thought were not there. And that's the thing about the light. Like that's the, that's the difference between the false light. The false, the false light is like, <laughs> forgive me, I, if, forgive me if I offend anyone, but like, you know, what's that? That alien thing, I, that circle light that I see like YouTubers have in the background, like the ring light, the ring the, light, the ring light where they makes them look really good and everything. Like uh, that's the false light. The false light, it gives you just the angle. It gives you, it gives you enough to see as you want to be seen. Yeah. But the true light, the light of Christ, this is the type of, I mean, when he says he who you know, walks after me will not walk in darkness. Like, you're exposed and that exposure leads you to this place of vulnerability and that vulnerability think about the cross think about the image of the cross think about the the quote-unquote symbolism of the cross and the exposure of, of god being completely think of the the posture of the cross think about his nakedness think about all these things and think about the absolute strength the absolute fortitude the absolute steely resolve that god demonstrates you know in the person of christ on the cross that is the thing about true light versus the false light which you know obscures and it does and it does it, it distorts and it's that's what those that to me those self-defense mechanisms i mean that's the thing it's so funny because that's the thing, I mean, getting back, this seems to be a thing that's coming up, but that's the thing about, about dope and about drinking. It's like, it's a false light. It gives you this sense of whether it's bottled courage or, you know, I'm, I'm super high and I think that I'm brilliant and I've tapped into all the, all the mysteries and I'm just, you know, the reality is I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a knuckle dragging Neanderthal. Like all of the ways that the, that this false light is, it's a deception. It's a, twisting of not just the, your perception of the world but sadly and even more tragically your perception of yourself yeah right especially and, and, perception of self oh i mean it's crazy it's crazy and that's i think one of the big things about when you approach christ which is getting into why what we're always talking about or i should say who we're always talking about is simply not a what like we're not talking about a moral system. We're not talking about even, even like a, some sort of like cipher or legend by which you can, you know, understand, you know, deep, deep hidden meanings. It's not like a, like Christ isn't like an umberto echo. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? We're, it, it's, it's so much, he is so much more than that. And it's very painful actually. Um, to go through that process of being exposed like that. But, but also kind on of, the other end of that, that's where you encounter wisdom and, and, and light and the light of holiness. And you can sense it. I mean, any of us who've read something like, you know, a, a well-beloved saint who, you know, today, St. Nectarios, like you read anything from St. Nectarios, you're like, wow, human beings actually can be holy and pure, like, wow, God actually does dwell with men, St. Paisios. I mean, that's the thing about the saints is they are these revelations of the light of, of God and the light of God, not just being some sort of mythical statement, but something that's actual, something tangible, something that we still encounter to, these, to this day. And something that, to be frank, turns us into men, and women who have strength and that kind of steely resolve like Christ does. That to me is incredible. It's incredible. And the, fa the false light is anti-transformation. Mm -hmm. Although it makes us feel in the moment as though we have been transformed. It's somehow. distorted, right? Like yeah. the true light transfigures. The true light transfigures, transfigures us. Yes. Right? The, the the false light distorts and perverts and it's twists. An it's an Instagram filter. It's an Instagram filter, for sure, for sure, for sure. 
And, and I think that's one of the things kind of getting to what Andrew is saying. One of the ways that you can tell is, um, I don't know, I, like I, I've, I had one, one season in my life when I was in really good shape right before I met my wife. And ever since then, it's been a wrap. But like, oh, no. like <laughs> uh, but I just remember hey, like, hey, oh, like the, the thing that, that kept pushing me was that like you, you, can't, you can't progress in regards of, of your health without being honest, if that makes sense, right? Because the second that you're like, oh, it's all good. Well, you know, you're eating that whatever and you know you're not hitting it like you should, right? And that's, that's the downfall. But you're like, I'm seeing a little cut right here. Okay, that's good, right? You see that little bit of cut, you see that little bit of muscle popping through or whatever, you're like, I want this, right? And, and you won't, you don't cut yourself slack. You're like, you're, you know what I mean? You're into it. Whatever that's going to be, like whether it's studies, your art, your craft, whatever it is, like when you want something and you get that taste of it, it's interesting to me because that love, it's, it's love, it's some measure of love, it propels you forward and makes you to want to be more honest and more vulnerable because you know that's the only way to get it, right? Whereas the false light is like quite the opposite. The false light gets you to settle. The false light gets you to say, I'm, I'm good. I'm still looking good. I still got it. Ah, 25 pounds. And it's really 23.4. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. It's okay. You know, and those types of concessions, they're real. Um, and I think that's where the, the incredible um, level of depression I mean, we, a lot of people talk about anxiety these days, but the other side of it, which I feel like isn't talked about as much recently, is depression, Yeah. right? Like, I hear lots of talk of anxiety, I hear very little talk of depression, which is the same coin but a different side. And that depression, that despondency, that is something that is a, a direct fruit of that false light, because you know that you aren't what you think you are. And so you just, you keep doubling down um, on your excuses. Do you, think, do you think, Father, that part of it is because of the nature of social media? And that is that, like, people who are depressed are much less likely to be, like, actively communicating, mm -hmm. whereas people who are suffering from anxiety will be over communicating. Mm -hmm. And so it's like because of the nature of, like, our communication systems that anxiety is just like forward because those people who are who are suffering from anxiety are just constantly pushing out the message whereas depressed people are are not do you think that there's do you think there's a correlation there i mean i know that like depression in my limited time with social media and getting the message out there in, depression is not how i feel it's anxious anxious is how i feel after i spend a while on my phone like i don't i don't i'm not like <sighs> and I set down my phone, I'm like, well, sometimes I am, but most of the time I'm like, that was fine. That was not a big deal. It was not a big deal that I did that. Like, it's okay. And then it takes me like a couple seconds to be like, no, I feel ucky. I feel ucky. Yep. I do. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it depends on, cause I know there's, I know a lot of people. Um, cause I was one of those people who it, it would leave me feeling just kind of a little bit despondent too, you know? Um, there's a lot of people, for every, for, for every person who's out there just kind of like stepping over their toes and just kind of getting in the mix over communicating, there's probably two to three more people who are just lurking, who are just kind of like looking at everyone's life vicariously, scrolling mindlessly, feeling left out, feeling like they're not loved. You know what I mean? Like that, I think that's, uh, that's the kind of untold mass of people, I would say, in regards of social media. Did a fair portrait there i can totally see that you know by the way mean? yeah really quick my friend nathan came up with the best term for that just sitting there on the phone scrolling mm -hmm. he calls it doom scrolling <laughs> and i'm like that's exactly what it is because it's funny because that's we're, he was the topic of conversation a lot today and i, I was telling the nuns i was like oh uh because i gave i in my phone he's nathan doom so oh. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah. Bonded over doom metal. That's yeah, well. You no, I, over something. I think he will be honored because he listens. So he will. Um, Shout uh, out. Hey yo, hey yo. 
Um, but that, so I just got to say real quick, there may be something here, maybe not, but like, I know that like, uh, on the idea of defense mechanisms, I see it a lot and I have, I have, um, observed that like a lot of times people's defense mechanisms tie to what kind of like the type a type b type c type of personality um and there's like a certain like like um white knuckling type of like self-defense mechanism i see a lot especially with type a people who are newly sober and they like want to get back to college they're like, I've been sober for like three weeks. I want to go back to school. And it's like, they're like, their backpack at, at, uh, at the meetings or whatever is like perfectly organized. And there's all these like different types of pens and like completely organized and like, and so like when I talk to them, there's like that, I don't know if you are Cyprian, but typically the thing you're talking about, the strategy, the like trying to one up is like a type A type of thing. It's like the type of like, I don't know. And it's not a one for one. Nothing's perfect. I'm just saying that these are general observations I've made. I'm ready to be wrong at any time. I think I'm type A in terms of my human relationships. Like I'm not type A in terms of like organizing my stuff and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm relatively disorganized. Sure. But in terms of the relationships in my life, absolutely. I like things so ordered. Like, and I, in the past, like I have, I have often told people that like, I, I will meet that and it, it, and it really upsets some people. Like I've probably lost some people who may have been able to be my friends in the past because I've been like, just so that, you know, like, okay, we're here hanging out for the first time. I'm, I, I will interrogate them. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore, but I will like interrogate them. And they'll be like, if they even sort of pick up on it a little bit, I'll just be like, look, so that you know why I'm asking you this, these questions. I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I'm talking to. Mm. And really like the, the, the subtext of that is I'm trying to figure out who you are so I can properly place you mm -hmm. into my nicely structured mm -hmm. like web mm -hmm. of relationships and know how you connect in every way and have it all structured, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely, dude. <laughs> and so, I hadn't realized that until just now. So okay. like, <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But I will also say that then there's another one, which is all, I guess I'm just going to like, just talk about it on the podcast or whatever. I guess that's what I'm about to do, but like, is more of like, a is the thing that I do, which is, I think a lot more relatable to people who are maybe not so like, um, physically motivated for things, you know, like maybe they're like intellectually or like artistically motivated is this like manifestation of always needing to know the band that you're talking about. And you've already seen them live. Mm -hmm. Like that was like a couple of years ago. I had the T I had it worn out like two or t-shirt of this band long before you even heard of them mm -hmm. type of thing. And like, that's my particular defense mechanism. And it's like, um, so I swear I have a point. All of this is to like bring it back to the fact that like, Father, you said a while ago that, yeah, it really stinks. So, I mean, quote unquote, whatever. This is my take on what you said. It really stinks sometimes when you have to like get closer to that light because you start to really see some stuff that's coming up, some things you're not happy about. And perhaps, then let's not rule this out. I am just not nearly as progressed as I should be. But every time I get one of those things pointed out to me, there's this like moment of just being like, that sucks. Like, I really don't like that thing about me, but thank goodness I know now, like, yeah. at least like, just tell me what the problem is. Yeah. Tell me what to do. And like, you're not going to give me more than I can handle. Just give me this little revelation about myself just so I can just do that slump down sigh and be like that's absolutely true and just a bunch of tension leaves my body and then i just like give up that battle and i'm just like yep that's that's true about me that's absolutely surrender surrender it's surrender it's just serenity yeah. and it sinks because it's not a high it's not a high it's peace it's like and think that's the difference between the two lights from an emotional perspective is the way that i tend to approach things is one is going to make and just go ahead and stop me at any time, Father, and correct me if I'm wrong. But like when I'm at my highest, mm -hmm. I am 
I'm worshiping something I shouldn't be worshiping, mm-hmm. like, like not actively, but actively worshiping something I shouldn't be worshiping. I'm, I'm building my structure on that foundation. When I'm low, I tend to just be, I, I, I am more sure that I can be more sure that what I'm doing is at least approaching a more right understanding of my relationship to Christ, especially is that like, wow, I just, I just really don't know a whole lot. Do I, there's just a whole lot. Yeah. Of- you know, I, it, you're talking and it, you know, when the Lord says my peace, I give into you, not as the world gives it, do I give? And like, it's the same thing. The, the peace of the Lord, what people think of as peace I think this is where a lot of people miss it too, is um, people think of peace or even there's people who like, let's say the Jesus prayer, you know, and they want to look at the Jesus prayer as like um, the kind of Christian nod to, you know, kind of meditation and just, you know, finding like center and like it can do that, but the problem is, is that the, like the Jesus prayer, right? The peace that it gives, it isn't the kind of like, ah, uh, like, yes, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a peace that comes from the presence of Christ, which brings light, which brings a revelation of self and, and your passions begin to be revealed and they begin to burn up. Um, and that burning up process, it, it's it's tough. And there's a peace, there's a, a stillness that one begins to enter into, but um, it's a stillness that allows the process of that vulnerability to happen. Because like what happens is when you don't have that, you're constantly flinching, you know, something comes up and it's like, no, 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 no. Like I, I remember... I remember early on when I first started really trying to understand prayer, I would have these moments. I still get them, but you know, I acclimated a little bit, at least, thank God. But I would have these flashes of just something so embarrassing that I did. <laughs> yeah. Just so I get those. Oh, yeah, so I get those. embarrassing. And like I would have these, like, if it's one of the reasons why you need to go to your closet because there's all kinds of like, oh, there's all kinds of just like utterances and groans and stuff that can come out when you're really in it, right? Yeah. Um, and just the kind of horror of the fool that you are, the horror of like, just the falseness of, of what you thought you were, who you thought you were. All those moments are, I mean, and if you know, if you've had them, you know what I'm talking about, how painful they are. It's like, it's like watching an episode of Three's Company and Jack does something really bad, in it, but like a million times like worse. It's just like, what in the world is this so embarrassing? I can't believe I said this. I can't believe I did it. But the thing is, what comes from that once you begin to really embrace it, it's that transfiguring. It's it's that change. It's like, okay, you know, I I, I really see that. And it it if you pay attention to it it pays out pretty quick. I don't really, I don't really have, you know, I don't have some kind of analogy I could give in regards of like exercise, but I could just say like in regards to music, it was like learning a scale and like, for whatever reason, that scale clicks and you're like, oh man, like I can, I can instantly put this into play or you learn a technique with like, oh, I, I just learned how to do this kind of, you know, point of light. I can play with this color here, just something where you have some sense of um, skill in something, but then you just learn something and it just kind of like levels you up a little bit. And you're like, oh, okay, that's, let's play with this a little bit. That type of understanding happens when you are vulnerable. That type of understanding happens when the light, the true light comes and you, you ex- you're exposed in those moments. You're like, oh, this is very painful. I'm very embarrassed right now, but man, I bet you if I really try to work at this, some things will change. You'll see it. You'll see your interaction with your spouse or with your your friends or whatever. You can see it. You can become, it's like uh, things slow down and you're able to, to, to see the thing coming. 
you're able to you're, see it's, like it sounds like a echo of the zone of proximal development like being in the zone that's where like you're it's like even the thing about things slowing down but the thing about the zone of proximal development is that like in order to get into it you have to be at the very edge of your competence so you have to actually be in a uncomfortable and painful mm. position in order to even fall into the zone mm. i mean i mean i know you've with music I mean, and art look, and sports and i mean i know you've experienced it yeah you know I, mean, I mean it's it's this is and it's also spiritually elder joseph elder joseph the hesychas he says it's at the end of our endurance that grace comes it's at the end of, our, of endurance as in grace comes that's those are those moments and that's again saint sophroni you know, stand at the edge of the abyss when it becomes too much, have a cup of tea, right? His, that's his take on, you know, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. These, these, this tension of being at the edge of shadow and flame, I mean, that is, that's the thing, right? And that is, and, and look, Christ descending into hell, right? There are the, the, these are these moments where we are dead and buried with him in baptism, Ephesians, uh, Romans 6, right? But there's also this piece where he descends into the lower realms. And this is what happens to us when we descend into these places of darkness and, and flame in our lives. And we're like, this is, in, this is insane. And it's only possible to come out of that in any type of redemptive sense in the light of Christ. Because outside the light of Christ, we do everything that we used to do before knowing him and everything we've been talking about earlier in this conversation, all of the, all the machinations, all the defense mechanisms, whether it's excessive drink, drug, sex, controlling of people, manipulation, those are all things to just really hide the fact of that where we, what we've descended into. Right. Yeah. But in, in Christ, we descend into these places and liberation begins to happen, a real, a real liberation of our soul, right? But you have to descend first. There's no resurrection without crucifixion, and there's no resurrection without crucifixion and descent into hell. Like, it just doesn't happen, right? You have to experience those things on a very real spiritual level before you can begin ascending into these places of illumination and like grace, experiencing grace. I mean, cause that's really, I would hope that's one of the things people should really be, be wondering about, and especially in the topic of talking about light of light, you know, it's like, well, how do we participate in, in the light of Christ? And this is it, but it's, it's not cheap and it's not easy. And it, you have to go down to these these nether worlds of of self and really experience it you know there's this also puts, a part uh, in, this puts oh go ahead go ahead dude uh well there's also a a part in star wars where that happens <laughs> where uh when kylo ray and uh kylo ren and ray are fighting at the end of the first movie yeah uh, right. first awaken a force the first awakens <laughs> the force awakens and um is like right when she's getting like standing on the precipice of like falling into this big chasm or whatever because star killer base is falling apart and like it's that moment i have so many times where it's like she's just like facing absolute destruction and like there's no way to go and her mortal enemy standing right in front of her and she turns back and he's like i could teach you the ways of the force and she's like oh the force and then she like closes her eyes and like when she opens them again like it's there and you can see it. So she had to endure all of that stuff to get to this point of standing literally on the edge of hell. Because I mean, if I remember correctly, it's been a while. There's like a river of lava or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Molten so, something. Yeah. So then I I just don't feel like this would be this podcast if I didn't you guys just laid down some dope spiritual stuff. And I was like, well, in Star Wars, you can really make a parallel between <laughs> rage. Well, that, that, I, I think you actually got to what I was going to say. Well, because it, it, yeah, no, it's, it, it's the perfect, it's completely You're related. Welcome. Welcome. Because it is adding a new, let's say, understanding to me of 
let's say what is missing from the Petersonian and the sons of Peterson when they say, carry your cross, right? So often when they say, carry your cross, they're like, there's something hard to do, man up and do it. That's what they mean. But they don't finish it out because it's like, no, you are carrying your cross to the place where you will be crucified mm -hmm. on that cross. Right. You're carrying, what right. you're doing is you're, 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 you could, cause you could just stop right now and you don't get crucified, but no, you are going to lift up the instrument of your suffering mm -hmm. and carry it to the place of it. The carrying the cross is not the suffering. Yeah, <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you are going to carry it to the place. That's not the hard part, right. but for them, they stop carry your cross all of this would be better if you just carried your cross because what like, it is is there's still a place of i can st i'm a hero like do you see what i'm saying there's still this place it's it's just another it, it's kind of like a further development of that defense mechanism yeah right? it's just it's it's in a different light and that's one of the things where let me god help me let me try to be a little bit more succinct in what I'm trying to put across, which is um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just start reading the prologue of Okrit every day. And what you'll find is pretty much it never ends like this and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> there, you're not going to read an, a hagiographical account of and they lived happy every once in a while you'll get like and he lived to, to ripe old age you'll you'll get those like you'll get one of those for every like 60 <laughs> they had their heads chopped off hands chopped off she had her breasts chopped off they were burned alive like that's i think the thing that that other side of it where and that's some of that false light you know it's like yeah the 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 Petersonian thing, it's good to get people into the doorway, but people got, got to really watch it because as long as everything is in the light of the um, the kind of like narrative and the arc, right? It, it's still very much in your control. And that's the difference is like, that's, there's there are parallels in what we're talking about, but the difference is, is what we're talking about, it's going to lead to death. Yeah. It's going to lead to humiliation. Like it, like this, this won't, no, no one gets out alive. Like that's, that's what we say, right? We go, yeah, no one gets out alive. And, and, and that's another reason why for some people, this false light also too, of a kind of like historically pure Christianity or orthodoxy is, is super attractive, but it's, it's wrong. Yeah, It's wrong because it leads people to this place of, well, we can reclaim culture. It's gonna, we're gonna build a Christian utopia. This is, this is, you know, um, millenarianism. This is, this is Kiliasm. This is, we're gonna build, you know, a utopia here in quote unquote Christ's name, right? But the fact of the matter is, is like, no, you're not, because um, there is gonna be a judgment, there is gonna be a second coming. Time will end. We don't know when it could be another 150 million years. We could, you know, whatever, but it's going to end. And none of the ventures of man are going to last, right? There is this weird tension that we have to hold on to in regards of the pursuit of the true light, because the true light transcends this and it has to, right? And it's, it's transcendence is found in revealing the, the foolhardy, fragile reality of entropy. Like all that is, all of the, all of the, the fact that everyone you know and love is gonna die, right? That is where we find, that's where we start entering to that true light because it's only in that true light then you can actually say to yourself, I have to have a hope in the resurrection of the dead. It, this simply can't just be kind of mythopoesis, like high, you know, uh, you know, symbolism, mythology, like, like 
I have like when you bury your your parents, God forbid you ever bury one of your children. God forbid you bury a spouse. You face it, right? When you slowly rot away because of cancer or you become crippled, you face it. There is no like, you know, it's gonna pull out the last second, man. There is no pulling out the last second, right? That's the thing is we are all laid low in death, period. And it's those of us who caught the scent of the hair, who, like those of us who have not simply caught the scent, but seen the hair, that's the hope. You enter into that and you're like, okay, here we go, right? I at least know where I'm headed, right? And, and that's the difference between the cat who is been stalwart, the kind of, you know, all the good stuff people, but at his deathbed, he's like, oh my gosh, here they come for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Versus the one who, you know, when his faculties fail him, his soul is still pining after God, you know? Like I saw that, I saw that with my mom. Her faculties were failing her. I mean, but I began to read the Psalms to her and then just, you know, I, there's no other way to explain except it was her spirit began to just moan and receive like just it's the only comfort I ever saw I saw in her in those last few hours of her of her life it's like her brain functioning was was gone you know what I mean yeah but but when I read the psalms to her it was just like her soul was receiving it you know these are the things that this isn't nice poetic language per se this is reality and it's it's the beauty is found to some degree in the terror yeah if, if you understand what i'm saying there the, the the terror is the reality that allows the beauty to be even more incredible you know but this is this is what the light looks this is what this is the experience of the light i mean if you have to have someone die close to you then it should probably it should be before uh, lent because that happened to me my grandma died in 2015 in march of 2015 and it, i was not super in the church at that time I, I was still there but i wasn't going like a whole lot but it was cool burying her and then going to church and like literally like singing like christ is risen from the dead mm -hmm. trampling down and it's like so real at that moment of just being like this isn't like an excuse to go to like your fairy land when you die, you know, Oh, there might be something It's like, Oh no, literally like the next time this coffin opens, God willing, it will be for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's like the brutal visceral reality of like what's happening at that moment. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, this is, this is kicking off something for me because of the thing that happened to me this morning. And it's something that it's something that I have been had been thinking about of like just the very kind of pragmatic sort of the pragmatic sort of why when thinking about my mortality, like why, why would I want to be transformed? Why would I want to stop doing these things? Why would I want to be more sober? Why would I want to be illumined? And I think that it, it's funny because like, even as I try to like think those things out the feeling that i get is just like because dude you're gonna die yeah. like w which which one is which way is better like at the end like which if it's tomorrow which one is better you know there's no there's no pot of gold like what is the your your chain what are you chasing after mm -hmm. you know it's it and it's like no wouldn't wouldn't you just rather not be doing the thing now that you've been shown that like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. Wouldn't you just rather not do it? Because, and wouldn't you rather get those things out of the way and like do and, and move? What, what, would, what would it be like if you weren't doing those things? What would it be like if you were moving in this direction? And then it's like, even if it's tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, even if it's tomorrow, it's like still better, still better. Like, mm -hmm. and, and this is where I see but that, see, that, just, that right there, what you're talking about, though, that's the positive side of repentance. That's, yeah. it, it's hard. It's, it's, I feel like so much of the talk, at least on my end, when we talk about repentance, 
it's kind of like the negative thing of just like die yourself but like that's the positive side of it is what you're saying right there is that you see like well yeah what else would i be doing yeah like once you once you're awake when, once your eyes are open to where you were at what you were doing what you were about you're like oh man like i don't and and, and that is that is not i'm being compelled by just simply moral conviction that's a real change of heart right not just not just external behavior so i didn't mean to interrupt you i just wanted to catch that real quick because that's no i i no it's it, because it goes into to what i was saying is that where i'm seeing a disconnect i was actually just listening to i'm, I'm not going to call them call them out but i was just listening today to two individuals who were talking a lot of, about orthodoxy and that how they've sort of like found let's I, I don't know if either one of them is has is is has has gone to a service has spoken with the priest but they sure seem to be reading a lot and like and god bless them and that's good right but it's like there are other people who have been like i'm going to church this sunday because like that's the way i like i want to experience this and i i feel like the disconnect is in this dialogue what i saw was this like yearning or this searching for well if we had a better like technique strategy style mm -hmm. then maybe we could win x mm -hmm. battle then maybe mm -hmm. we could build x thing these like x then maybe the civilizational project could actually be done and these other styles are no good i felt like i was listening to somebody like talking about like ufc back in the day when they used to like have all the different styles in there mm -hmm. and me and my buddies would sit around and talk about well you know like this one compared to this one and this and you know before yeah. they were all just doing this mma style and it's like i just there seems a huge disconnect there because i'm like i don't even know what that project is and i'm not even sure that like is there like i think the project is me like i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's that's part of the problem kind of getting back to like royal path like that's the big problem with any type of sustained sustained inter intersection of politics and and faith politics and religion politics and spirituality right any type of sustained ongoing intersection that's always going to be problematic because you know the person on the left is wanting to find you know a better more compassionate you know uh society and all this stuff right um but the problem with that is is like yeah it's we should have compassion yeah we should care for the, the marginalized all that stuff like the gospel commands us to but again, the, the problem with it is, is that <clears throat> the light reveals to us that not every suffering should be alleviated in the way that you think it should. <laughs> Amen. And that, and that you are actually getting in the way of the of the, the work of the Almighty, oftentimes. Uh. Because, because you are uncomfortable and uh. because you think that you know better, which is very oh, that's big. The you are uncomfortable. Right. It makes it's you very... uncomfortable to right. see that. So right. yeah, oh uh, man. It's very it's very luciferic. It's very luciferic. The other side of it, though, is kind of what we've been talking about today is, or tonight is just like, yeah, we're going to build back better. We're going to win, right? And that that's the Trump side of it. It's like, no, 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 we're not losers. We're winners, baby. We're winners. It's like, yeah, Jesus was not a winner, you know? Like, and, and people hate to hear that, but like the fact of the matter is, is Jesus was not a winner. And it's precisely only in understanding that do you start to even begin to get it, right? Because that, that right side temptation of correctness and winning and being on top and we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna, you know, build back, whatever it is, whatever the, whatever the slogan's gonna be, um, you, that, is a, that is the other side of that error. And it's really dangerous because people who sustain and imbibe these perspectives, these you know right and left political paradigms and perspectives, and even these right and left um, spiritual perspectives, you know of being correct or being you know 
compassionate in an autonomous sense, a, a, apart from Christ and apart from yeah. the, the crucifixion of, that he calls us to, they're both, they'll, they'll, they're both roads to hell, you know, because they don't give you, they don't give you true light. They give you a light that is, you know. I mean, isn't that kind of what the false light that is being preached a little bit right now? I think I kind of talked about it on like one of the earlier ones, but I can't remember that it was like this whole hashtag be kind. Like it was like, I can be really good and I don't need all that repentance stuff. Mm -hmm. Like just be kind, just be nice. To yeah, I mean, isn't that the thing with like some of these, and I don't know, correct me, Cyprian, I don't know if they're like technically new atheists anymore. I don't know what they call like, like post new atheist or something, but like the whole, we don't need God for morality. We can be, you know, I, I just know there's a whole yeah. line of thought like yeah. that currently, which is like secular, secular. I don't know what they would, what they would call the secular humanists maybe, yeah. or something. but they're after the new atheists. I don't know if they have a name, but they have definitely abandoned. Well, and I know these, and I know the exact people that you're talking about. And they're like, I, I feel like they're sons of Peterson too, mm -hmm. because, because like, I feel like he took all of the, all of secular, all of secularism and like, everywhere where the new atheists fa failed, where the alt-right failed, where all of these mm. sort of secular projects failed, he popped them into this one very nice package that got so close. Mm -hmm. And well, and then he vanished. Mm -hmm. right? Why don't you and throw out a term to try and name them real quick, see if it sticks. I don't, I don't know. I like, like I'm more leaning towards very heavily using the term secular just because but just because of the idea of like this world, the prince of this world. Right. That's, that's good. I mean, that's, you what know, it is. that's what it as is. opposed to atheists to be like, well, no, you're a secularist because you worship this, th this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You because worship it, the prince of this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Oh, I don't have the word. It, it's it. really good like that too, because the problem with atheists is that it excludes so many of the people that need to be included, which are people who have religious affect. People are like, I'm religious, or even like I'm spiritual, whatever. And you know, they are completely devoid of the light of Christ mm. because of this unwillingness to to lose, this unwillingness to suffer, this unwillingness to trade in whatever this world quote unquote has, right? For the sake of the greater kingdom, right? Like friendship with the world is enmity with God. Like those statements, people don't take literal enough from my perspective, right? You know, speaking as someone who lives great, you know, speaking as someone who lives like a king, like I live, I, I, I got it better than any king of old. I can go downstairs and get a cup of ice. You know what I mean? I can have a cup of ice. That, that alone shows you the opulence I'm living in because I can have ice whenever I want it, you know? All that being said, that the fact of not getting the not getting this reality of like you got to be you got to be a loser, man. And in regards of in the light of the world, that's the only that's the only way this works. You know, that's that's that gap where a lot of these people just they won't they won't go there. You know what I mean? I was watching. Um, I mean, it's just funny. I get it. Like. I get the need to just make nuance and concession, but I was watching uh, this one YouTuber guy. He's good. I like his stuff. He's a real sharp guy, young Orthodox guy. Um, but he was doing kind of a critique on cult of personality. He's really good. Um, he's talking about Trump. He's kind of doing like a whole, someone else had done, like I think it was like Washington Post had done this whole montage of Trump's faith, whatever, Trump's Christianity, and just, all these cringeworthy quotes he has like oh me and the man upstairs we're really good i don't have to ask for forgiveness like all that crazy stuff that trump says but like the crazy thing about that is i've known so many people so many guys like that with like of course i'm a christian like i'm an american like of course i'm a christian like you know but no i don't i don't have to ask for forgiveness me and the me and the guy upstairs we're good like literally those types of 
I can have church on Sunday watching football. Like that's my church. Yeah. You know, like whatever it I've is. I've heard that like, so many times. Me and the big guy, we're good. He he knows where we're at. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh man. Um that and, and it, forgive me how pretentious that sounds, but it's like to me, that's that is such a um painfully broad perspective that i mean it's a broad perspective than than i would hope for but but it's it's a well-had perspective by a lot of people man you know and it, and it's passed off as good good religion you know what i mean it's passed off as it's passed off is, better than this nothing is balanced. right this is balanced you're he's he's being balanced what do you say cyprian well, I said it's passed off as being better than nothing, like better than right. being an atheist or something. Right. And I'm like, I don't know if that's better than I, I've never thought that was better than being an atheist. Yeah, never I thought that like I mean, it, Father Sarah from Rose. Right. It's like that was his thing with atheists. He's like, yeah, I mean, I reject that same God you're rejecting. I mean, the thing about a lot of atheists is that. Like, if, if you're honest and they're honest, you can get it. You can be like, yeah, I get it, man. You know what I mean? You, you've had nothing but these really terrible experiences and examples. And, you know, that's where it's just like, you don't care, but I'm going to pray for you. You know what I mean? Because um, when you see some people, man, God bless them. The blessing is a curse. The curse is a blessing. But some people, they just do not have a tolerance for hypocrisy and BS. Like some people don't. And, it, it of course if we want to drill we drill down it's their ego too sure it's their pride sure it's their sense of self-righteousness sure nevertheless if you're one of those people it's tough it, it's really tough to um and i think that's what happens for a lot of people they they see the claims of christianity they see all these things and they see people living like antithetical to it and it just yeah. turns them Left or right, whatever, like sure. le left sure. or right, it just it turns them off, and you're like, yeah, I get it, you know, I get it. This is this was this was something that, you know, a, a friend of ours here, a mutual friend here, he would keep coming back to, is you know, he would if if he could find any failing in a hierarchy or anything like that an example oh well but about this person doing this and oh this but this person and and this president they're buddy buddy and oh but these two patriarchs are fighting with each other and they're at odds with that so doesn't that necessarily mean that the entire church is is um you know well that 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 means that the because the church should be perfect and then all all human beings should be any if it's the church and it's it is what it is then all human beings should be perfect and i think that it's it's actually a response to American Protestantism mm -hmm. presenting that as what the, the church is supposed to be. So like the Rick Warrens or the Joel yeah. Osteens when it's like, you see Joel Osteen and you see his wife and it's like, everything is perfect, perfectly blessed. Every, we're, we're great. We're wonderful. We have no failings ourselves. Maybe once in the past, I, I had some failings, but look, everything is like perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's not, how, how, how can you, everybody sitting in the audience has to know, like, that's not me. Right. I, that was the reason why I felt like fell out and was rejected that outright was I was like, I don't, I must be either you're all faking or which is horrible and I don't want to be here or I'm the worst person on earth because I don't like life for me is not like anything like the, like what you're describing it. There's like, there's way more pain and way more suffering in my life than, than what you're describing here. Like everything is kumbaya for all of y'all. Yeah, I mean, like in the West speaking as a convert, I mean, I know it's incredibly difficult to accept that, like, if something is going wrong in your life, that like, may one, maybe you really like, not done something to like, make God mad, quote unquote, so this bad thing is happening to you, but also that like, if something's bad is happening, you're doing something wrong. Like, I mean, if like, if you're encountering like, obstacles and like, you know hard times and it's like 
man, I wasted all of last week because I was dealing with this problem. I didn't have like any time to enjoy myself. It's like, well, no, I think orthodoxy would teach you like that time is much more valuable. That like that, that hard week that you went through is actually much more valuable than like a week where you're just like kicking back. Um, and I, yeah, like I, 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 you're, that's you're a great point, really yeah. good there. I just want to flesh it out in the sense of, so I think for some people this could be kind of confusing, but in my experience, the best way to explain this is it's the difference between um, there's there's a pain and a discomfort that comes from me saying no to cheesecake bites and pizza every night and and going to the gym or working out or just walking or just you know what i mean there's there's a discomfort there that i have to learn to embrace versus the discomfort of like being super obese and having all these problems and tolerating that do you see what i'm saying that's the difference between tolerating one type of pain versus embracing another kind of pain like that's the difference because for instance like people could if 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 people were of a, a weaker constitution, they could hear a conversation like this and be like, what in the world? Why would I ever want to join your terrible religion? Like, why would I ever want to be like, all you talk about is suffering, all you talk about is pain, this and that. Why would I want that, right? But the the, the, the qualification or the, or the context of clarification I think I want to give here is obviously it's good because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here talking about it, but it is the, it's the pain of being an athlete who is competing. That's, that's the pain that we're talking about versus the pain of a heroin addicted, diabetic, you know, whatever, like where- But the heroin felt good in the moment. The hair was Every, felt good. It feels good in the moment. Right. I mean, right. I love being comfortable. And if I can, like, get my kids to church by 10 o'clock, I mean, most Sundays, and, like, do that whole argument while fasting and while, like, trying to get them ready. And, like, I love being comfortable. And if I'm willing to do that, you know, as often as I can, then there's got to be something. Like, I'm not doing it out of some kind of religious obligation. I don't and have you know to. he loves being comfortable because he's literally sitting here in the bathroom. In the bathroom, <laughs> in like my most luxurious chair I have in the entire house. I'm like sitting here. I'm I'm kicking it right now. And like, it, it's comfort from head to toe, man. I mean, I got some pretty awesome pajama pants on too. So, and like, but like if there were a <laughs> the big Lebowski... Yeah, for real. <laughs> the white um, Russian. Yeah. Um, but like if there were a midnight service tonight, like I would have had to stop fasting and I, I would have had to start fasting and I would I would be there. And the reason I do that is because there's just something bigger there for me than that. Bingo. And, bingo. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. And I think just to be clear too, because having a sweet you know, green velvet bathrobe, there's nothing wrong with it. And hey, tonight, you know, was my daughter's birthday. I had some cheesecake bites. <laughs> I had some ice cream. I had a little mini eclair. You know what I mean? I laughed with my kids. I played some video games with my son. That's not the problem, right? Like, it's not a problem to enjoy our life. Like, we aren't, we fast because we love food. Because yeah. we because we we enjoy it, you know what I mean. We abstain from relations with our wives because we love our wives, and you know what I mean. It enhances the times that we are with them. Like that's the point of we don't deny ourselves because we hate the body. We're not Gnostics. We deny ourselves for precisely because we're thankful for the experience of life that God has given us through the body. Right. That's why we do it. But more importantly. We do it because we were aiming for something greater. And as and we're aiming for someone greater, right? And when we do, when we engage in these acts of self-denial, it hones our perception. And that work 
it's just, it's again, getting back to the athlete. It's like, I could eat the athlete goes, I could eat that pizza. I could drink that soda and it's fine, but you know what? If I don't eat that soda now and I don't eat that pizza or drink that soda, and eat that pizza. Now it's going to put me a little bit closer to hit that marker I got. Right. And there will come a time. Let me at least get through this next competition sure. and there will come a time. And, and that's the little surgical cycle, right? There's a time for me to feast and there's a time for me to fast, right? And there's a time for everything under the seasons, turn, 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 right? So like that, that reality is a part of that light, which is we taste of the good things of God now, right? Not in their fullness, not in their fullness, but we taste of them now. And interestingly enough, part of the good things that we taste of is this, there is something very sweet when you have said your prayers and you've done, you know, two or three, five more prostrations than you usually do. There's something, there's something sweet about it. Mm -hmm. There's something sweet about, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to say one more psalm. There's something sweet about it. Not, it's not some kind of crazy feat of asceticism. It's just this, like, it's, it's Father Sarah from Rose, right? Blessed Sarah from Rose. Push yourself just a little bit further, mm -hmm. right? Because this is where you find the light. My prayer is often a lot better when I just say, you know, just from an Orthodox, I'm only going to say the Trisagion. Mm -hmm. Like, that's my prayer I'm going to say tonight. It's tired. I'm late. Or <laughs> I'm tired. It's late. I'm saying the Trisagion. I'm going to bed. And then it's like, oh, wait, well, no, let's check out what's going on in this little prayer book over here. Mm -hmm. And then like, I mean, I forget who it was, but there's two saints is talked about in the book where they they one of the strategies they used was they were, uh, I believe, monks. And they were like, and the winter will quit being monks and like the devil would leave them alone. And then like winter would come around. But, uh, well, we're still here for a little bit longer. All right, we'll we'll leave in spring. And like, then the devil's like, okay, got him. Cool. And they like take off for a little while. And then like in their heart, they're like, mm, sucker, like I'm not <laughs> going anywhere. Like, and I do that. I don't always mean to bring it back to this, but I do that in sobriety, like, especially in early days, be like, if I still feel this way, five o'clock, I'll get wrecked. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, just like, that's just what's going to happen. Like if I still feel this terrible, I'll just go get wrecked. And like almost nine times out of 10, I never did. And then like, I still do that now. Oh, if I, if I feel this, it's kind of that oh, I'll kill you in the morning type of thing. Like you're safe for tonight. I'll kill you in the morning. And um, the last thing I want to say, is, I don't like hard boiled eggs, but nothing is better than that red dyed egg on Pasca because I've been fasting and I don't even like hard boiled eggs, but you give me like three of those hard boiled eggs. I'm just like going to town on them because it's just like, yep, these are really, really good. The joys of fasting is yeah. that finally Andrew can handle a hard boiled egg. So yeah. yeah yeah well i think we're coming we're coming in on it are we i thought we were really, closer really? to the the 40s i thought so it was were we yeah i mean whatever so, i'm not well what do you have what do you have because maybe it'll take us a while what do i have oh yeah oh gosh i haven't thought of this at all uh well i have a thought that okay. we can talk about and i'm gonna while i'm talking my mouth's gonna go and then my brain's gonna start working <laughs> on a question but I had an interesting thought the other day is we're in that part in Dark Knight where Batman's beating up the Joker, right? And the Joker's like, and as much as I don't like to do this because it's not a one for one, it's not perfect. But we're in the Joker is like, you have nothing. You can't do anything to me. Even if you kill me, I win. Like you, nothing with all of your strength can extract these answers from me that you want. Whereas like Harvey Dent and Rachel. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I was like, that's like a pretty saint like attitude to take because it's like, you're using the brute force of the world, which is just straight aggression and anger, which is Batman. Right. And you know, it's not a one for one because normally it's, it's reversed, but like the Joker was like, literally like you can do anything you want to me. Like, I'm not going to like back down on this because you have nothing to threaten me with. Like, if you kill me, I win. If you beat me up, that's fine. I don't mind pain because it's for a greater purpose. Like, that particular moment, I thought it was an interesting, and it kind of hit me. But that's, but that's also why Joker is a fictional character. Because you, you're not going to run across, like, a, 
I don't know if you're going to run across somebody who would do the truly heinous and evil acts that he did, but yet could not be threatened with anything. Because I feel like you could threaten psychopaths pretty good. Like you could threaten them like a, a, a psychopath, bodily harm. You can't threaten them with like any doing anything to anybody else or necessarily like taking their money, but bodily harm, you could threaten them. But that's, but see, this is where I argue where Joker would maybe take it a step farther than just your average run of the mill mm-hmm. psychosociopath. Uh, because like this guy truly, his one and, and only goal, not in the entire Batman mythos, but certainly in this movie, is to get Batman to kill him. He just wants Batman to kill him. Because mm. that's the whole point, is this whole ludicrous rule that seems to be fairly new from what I understand that Batman doesn't kill people. Batman killed people for a long time. I'm just going to mm. say that. As a guy who's buying the Golden Age comics right now, he kills pretty indeterminately. He's just like, oh, that guy accidentally fell off a building. What are you going to do? Like, he's dead now. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, yeah. we're going to yeah. move. There's a lot of that. Yeah, and like he literally like strangles a mentally ill person to death from a helicopter. He's like, oh, they're better off this way. Like it's not a big deal. Like that guy did nothing wrong. He was just happening at the wrong place at the wrong time. But this is why why Joker takes it like a step further than most people, and why you can at a certain point you can make this like total comparison. You can I don't know if you should or if it's really accurate, but you can make this comparison of like here's a man who's not afraid to lose everything and including like actually if he truly does lose everything and if he loses it in this correct way he wins so i mean what is he trying to do he's trying to martyr himself for a greater cause unfortunately that greater cause is stupid and it's not a good cause to martyr yourself for but what he's really trying to do is to prove to the entire world that like even your savior is not great enough like even you, even like your the best of you is still not good enough. Yeah, I think still- the thing though is it's it's an interesting thing because um, if I could try to like come in the middle of the of the two of you, hmm. I'll allow it. Uh, <laughs> like these guys really exist. There, I mean, there's people like Joker who exist. I mean, that's to some degree what someone would say the Taliban is. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say terror, terror to like a it, religious terrorist. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's that's like really a thing, and fundamentally, what's behind all that still is pride, because it's still oh, my yeah. ideology, the way I see things. Like this is, and and again, to me that. So, I look at that and go like, yeah, that's why everything else is false, and Christ is God, because. Christ as God, Christ is God, reveals this complete just who is willing to lose. Like no one's willing to lose, right? Because even even in this sense, like Joker isn't willing to lose. He says like, you're going to lose, like there's nothing you can do, whatever. But he's like, I have have the upper hand. I win. I'm going to win. win. I win. Yeah. Right? My perspective, my correctness, I still win. And and we, we shouldn't mistake his lack of value of his own life and life as some sort of virtue. Because it's not the same. It's just, he just doesn't value life, right? That, that's, that's not the same as the, the rejection of the temporal world and, and, and life in the sense of the temporal kind of um, the pride of life that Christ calls us to reject. If you, if you follow what I'm saying, there there's a qualitative difference that's there. And He's I think like seeking a twisted immortality. Yeah. I mean, it, it's very much a twist. It's, it's the kind, it's, it's very demonic in some ways because it's kind of like, this is, this is the idea. This is the, this is the piss and vinegar of the envy of Satan. It's like, you're going to see that I'm right. And I'm gonna burn everything down to show you. There's no love in that. Like it's not done out of love. It's done out of pride and spite, arrogance. Right? There's there's a very different thing. Love is willing to lose. Right? Like Father Anthony, Saint, Father Anthony Bloom. I'm gonna butcher it, but he has this quote which I remember. 
I was talking to my oldest son about this like two years ago and he was just like, what? And I was like, I quoted uh, Father, uh, Father Anthony Bloom. I was like, you have to realize that how powerless God is before you. And I remember my son was like, what? I thought he was all powerful. Like my son who's, you know, just going through those years, whatever. I was like, no, 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 no. God's powerless before you. He, he's chosen to be powerless. He's chosen to, to leave himself at the mercy of, of your will and your love or lack thereof. Like that's not Satan. Yeah. It's not the Joker. Satan and the Joker and everyone else is like, damn your love, damn everything about you. In fact, damn you. Because, because yeah. you... There's, it, a, there's a total reframing here as you're talking. And it, it really comes back to a little bit more to like actually like what the Joker is. You can make it actually a comparison um, is, and you ever have one of those thoughts that as you come out, starts to unravel a little bit. That's what's, that's what kind of happened with that whole Joker thing just now, but it's cool because it unraveled, but then God raveled it back up in a different way of being like the devil, uh, the Joker is basically saying to the Batman, there's no way you're this good. Mm -hmm. Like you can't be this good because mm -hmm. I'm not this good. And there's no way that that can exist. Mm -hmm. Like I'm seeing something that I wish I was and it can't be. So I have to prove it wrong. Yeah. I mean, that arrogance is, I mean, that's the thing that see now you're, now you're onto something because that's what I see in a lot of people who. I think I was onto something from the beginning, but that's fine. <laughs> yes. I, I, I see this in a lot of. I see this in a lot of people and I see it because it's one of those moments. It's one of those first things I had to see in me first. Mm. Like I I'll, I'll never forget being in a jail in Whittier, California and having this moment of finally getting it, finally being like, Oh man, like this is my fault. This isn't, I'm not here because the cop arrested me. I'm not here because so-and-so broke into the window of the hotel I was at to get the heroin. Like, like it's, it's no one's fault. Like I'm here because of boom, 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 boom. All the succession of things where I'm like, I chose to reject my dad. I chose to reject all these things. I chose to really exalt myself. You know, I didn't phrase it like that at the time, but that's that moment. And that's something that I, I just know it so painfully well. I just see it. And I don't mean that in a projection because, you know, I just, when I see people, I just try to, you know, just keep my silent prayer for them because it's not one of those things, even now, as, you know, a priest and a spiritual father, I can't really bring it up to people in any, in any type of like obvious way because it's, I just know how painful it is. And it's a type of thing where it's like, it's so it's so tough for people if you try to get that splinter not only will they like sock you in the face they'll sock you in the face and run out the run out the door you won't, you won't see them for a long time some things you, i just i go lord you're gonna have to put them to sleep on this one you know because it's yeah those, those types of moments of seeing yourself like that are really really painful you know well we talked about and you had said a wonderful thing of, you know, we were talking about this idea of, you know, people saying, well, it's not my fault. So it's not my responsibility. And you, mm -hmm. you had brought up this, well, it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. And maybe this is even like the level up because I found and it's your responsibility. <laughs> well, it, just, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. Like now what, mm -hmm. you know, like, do you take responsibility? Like it's, it's your fault. Like the situation that you're in that, I mean, maybe this was one of the, you know, it, this was definitely one of, I think the Petersonian concepts where I was like, this is spot on to where he's like, you know, the world is, if you think the world is terrible, it's because you now he said, it's because you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, it's like, well, the reframe is, well, it's your fault. It's your fault. If you're whatever situation you're in, because when I say the world is a terrible place, what I'm really, I mean, really honestly, what I'm saying is like, 
from the place that I'm sitting, I don't like what I'm seeing. And it's like, well, who put you in that? Who put you there? <laughs> sitting in the place that you're sitting to, to and, and who chose to look in the direction that you're looking, right? And it's like, with, with whose eyes and, and with what, you know, lens on. Can I, can I just say one thing though? I don't know if he, and I don't mean, I'm not challenging what you said. I just literally don't know what the case is, but is it a matter of, because I think this is how most people interpret this. Okay, go ahead. It, what's the phrase, what was it again? Like it's, you're not good enough. How, say it again. Yeah, he said, he said, if you think the world is a terrible place, it's because you're not good enough. Okay. That was his exact. Yeah. Now I took it, I took it in the way that I just described, but even as I said it back right now, I'm like, maybe that's not what he was. Yeah. Saying. Because, because he, that's the thing is like, even if, if, even if that's not how he meant it, I know that there's tons of people and, and these are the sons of Peterson. Right. But, cause I think for some people, they need us to unpack what we mean by that too. Because I enjoy tons of what Dr. Peterson says. Like, you know what I mean? But the sons of Peterson, they, that conclusion, which maybe he is or isn't there yet about like, Christ isn't just your kind of like mythical projection of like a, a humanistic younging, young idea, younging idea of good. Like when he says you're not good enough, they take it as like, I'm not, I'm not good enough as in, I need to achieve better, right? Not in the sense of good, as in God is good, as in love, as in purity, as in selflessness, as in this this divine. I think you're right. I think love, you're absolutely right. In, do you see what I'm saying? That, I think you're that, absolutely right that that's how 99% of the people hearing it would have heard it. And that's the problem. And that makes them go like, yeah. And that's where the that's where the the Western chauvinism starts to kick in, right? we invented science and we did this and we did that. And like, we're better. And like, we better, we gotta, like, we gotta be great again. Like that's, that's the problem. And well, that's it's, Ma even, it's MAGA. It's MAGA. It's, it is MAGA. And, it, and, it, and it's unfortunately very attractive to, to a lot of quote unquote orthodox folk. We're the ancient church. We're the historical church. We don't have all the Western errors. Like we, like, we got to be better. We got to build a new Byzantium. That, that's the problem, right? We got to be good. We got to succeed. We got to win, win, win. Like that, that whole thing, that's the problem, right? And the problem with it is, is like, it's all fine and dandy. Okay, great. But it's not Christ. Like that, like that's the problem, right? Good for you. You want to win? Hey, I don't want to be a loser either. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I say all this as someone who's day by day, sometimes minute by minute, <laughs> depending on who I'm with, I'm I'm learning to embrace losing, right? Hmm. Hmm. Like that's that's the name of the game, and and that's a real tough like that paradox, that that thing that's making you scratch your head right now. I'm like, there you go. If I would say to someone if they've been like okay, I'm kind of like not really sure what you guys are always talking about, but for me, I want to hone in and be like, this is one of those moments where I'm like, this head-scratching moment, if you can just hang in there, you're, you're, you're on the edge of encountering Christ because this, this beckoning to lose, which makes no sense in an irrational intellectual capacity, it makes no sense. Everything in you fights against that. Right. If you can just, it's put your hand in the box. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Sure. It's, it's, are you an animal or are you a human? Put your hand in the box. Like that's that's the thing. You know what I mean? And and that's well, that's how I would interpret good. You're not good enough, right? Um, but the only way to get good enough in that sense is to actually begin to turn to Christ and say like, all right, well, here we are, you know? Um, I, have, I have nothing to ever say that you are real or why I should even quote unquote believe in you, but 
I've got, I'm, I'm here at this point. I've listened to five hours of Jordan Peterson or whatever, whatever the situation is. This is, I think, where the shell begins to crack and something incredible is, is being revealed to you if you can put your hand in the box and keep it there, if that makes sense. Well, the corollary to you're not good enough is so th- so then you must so then you must orient toward or rely upon the one or surrender to the one who is not just good enough but who is who is as good as good could possibly be that's got to be the corollary because i because i think because because i'm starting to realize that like every every layer it's like there's more you know what i mean like the thing that happened to me this morning was really profound for me um i've i've like and it was it, it was one of these simple things but it was also exactly exactly like you say like it was a space that was completely dark it was a complete black box of who i'm 43 years old it's like to to be like oh i've got got a black box about something that's like fundamental to how I understood myself to move through the world and what I thought was like good in terms of moving through the world to be like oh no that's yep that's a defense mechanism Mm -hmm. like yep you're just that's that's your that's your own you're following fear when you do that is um it's like oh no I, even the even the thought that I could be could ever be good enough without Christ seems ludicrous to me. Mm-hmm. Ludicrous. Ludicrous. I couldn't have found. I couldn't have found like how much how many years of psychotherapy would it have taken? Right. For me to get that one. Well, you wouldn't still. I wouldn't. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Because because that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you wouldn't because even then the the psychotherapist would tell you no no no. Yeah. This is, listen this is good listen what's wrong this is good yeah and and some sort of justification would be presented to you in the guise of mental health yeah. right that that's that's the problem right and that's the other side of it is that the 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 sons of peterson this is they don't want to die that does just make it simple they don't want to die right and christians each level you're like okay i'm there and then another level of vulnerability another level of pain another level of suffering but another level of wisdom another level of joy inside all those things come and then you kind of acclimate and you're like okay well yeah. it's, it's time to do it again and go and go down another level right yeah. that's that's when you start seeing okay i'm not I'm not engaged in self-help here. Hmm. Something, something, someone, something divine is, is guiding this process because these last six months of what I've been through and what I've been doing are so different than the last six years, not of my own choosing. Clearly it, it, it can't be me, right? It, this can't be me uh-huh. because I, I would have done this, this, and this, right? And I'm wanting to go back for more. Okay, what what is this, right? Yeah, that's a weird experience. It's crazy. But very good. It's crazy. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has to be because I mean, if my life projection was going and then suddenly it stopped and it goes like way that mm-hmm. way, it's like if um, I were a ship, everyone were like, "What happened to this guy?" Which is my segue into the thing I thought of. I wanted to ask you guys. It's because there's a fantasy element in there somewhere. I don't okay. know. But uh, you could tell I obviously just thought of it on the spot. But I mean, I, okay. we, we get a lark out of it for probably like 10 minutes. That's fine. All right. Nothing written in, written in stone. Just okay. right off the bat. No big deal. Don't overthink it. What are your three favorite movies from the MCU? From the, uh... that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, okay. I don't even know if I have my three. I could fire off three I really liked. Well, I mean, I know my favorite without a doubt is Winter Soldier. That's that's the best one. Mm-hmm. I think Civil War is really good. 
Ragnarok and the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh. I would do Ragnarok, Winter Soldier, and I think the first Avengers, because there are just so oh, many okay. awesome Captain America moments in that. That's good. Um, That's the... Not... I don't know. No, it's a... There's only one God, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. There's that moment. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's so that's awesome. Really good. That's really good. I'm going to go with um, Ghost Rider. Oh, oh okay. come on. Electra and um, uh, what's his name? Ang Lee's Hulk. <laughs> really? <laughs> I think you Wait. misunderstood me, Father. I think I, think I never get to worse. troll. I just wanted to troll once in my life. I wanted to break character and just troll. I yeah. I just I smelled it as soon as it happened. I was like, all right, all right. I think you misheard me. It's, it's best, not worst. Man, Electra was so bad. Oh, that's why I was like, wow, this is. Dude, I don't know. I didn't see it. I never watched it, but just randomly because YouTube knows me, it suggests things. Uh, and like it showed me the final fight between Bullseye and um, Daredevil in the mm -hmm. show. And I've never seen the third season. I would, had stopped caring by then. But Father, you should look it up sometime. The imagery between them, because the whole thing is that the Kingpin stolen the Daredevil suit and he's wearing it for some reason. He's like committing atrocities while wearing the Daredevil King suit. Kingpin is oh, wearing. I'm so sorry. Bullseye. Oh, well, I, I was, was about to say, like, I don't, just like, yeah, don't worry about fit. it. Some tells me that fit in that suit. That's uh, what was that guy's name? Farley. That's a Tom. What, what's his name? Farley. John Farley. Tom Farley. Chris Farley. Chris, Chris Farley. Farley. Yeah. That guy in a little suit. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, that actually now my thing doesn't sound nearly as cool because that would have been way more. <laughs> That's super funny, actually. Like, he was the guy in the Daredevil that he was Daredevil. <laughs> and everybody's like, what happened to Daredevil? <laughs> no, and they don't address it the entire time. Nobody, Nobody says like, anything. Man. It was <laughs> definitely Daredevil. I've seen it before. It looked just like no one it took that yeah. drunken Irish stereotype too far. He's all bloated and yeah, oh 100 <laughs> percent Okay, but, wait, but what is it? Bullseye has stolen. Bullseye has stolen Daredevil suit, and so Daredevil's back to the year one Daredevil suit. You know what I'm talking about, Father? The yep. Frank Miller, yeah, yeah. the black. And he's got these huge wraps around his arm, and they're white. And man, it's just so Miller. It's just wow. so like man. It's like they're like his arms are kind of scrawny, and it's in real life. His arms are kind of scrawny. He's wearing these like huge bandages or something like that. But oh my gosh. I don't, I was never crazy about the year one Daredevil suit. It looks cool. It's fine. But that, I was like, wait, no, I definitely can get behind that. Like, that looks awesome. And I mean, that's all. I'm never going to watch the third season of that show. I, I stopped caring about those shows pretty quickly. But Father, do you have a sincere answer? Because if you don't, that's all right. I don't uh, know yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be like Batman versus Superman. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, that was a that was a good troll because that was a very those are good mm -hmm. picks. I mean, back the worst movie. I mean, the Ghost Rider with Nicolas Cage, like who's Nicolas thought Cage. about that? Who's thought about that, right? So I wouldn't have even if you. I wouldn't have even. That's not even in the catalog. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty proud of those those things that I threw out. Actually, <laughs> wow. fantastic, a uh, Fantastic Four: Rise of the Silver Surfer. Actually. Don't. That's a that's a bad one. No Don't man, listen. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne as the Silver Surfer. Yeah, no, no, no. That's cool. That's, that's pretty awesome, awesome that's actually. Cool. And Chris Evans was a good Johnny Storm. Yeah, like, like yeah, yeah. yeah. No. It's yeah. Just I that mean, Galactus thing. Yeah, it's it's not on my list, but you know, I'll give it. I'll give it its due. I'll give the devil its due. Uh, I don't know, man. That that's a tough one because there's a lot of like head nods I want to give. Um, but definitely Winter Soldier, um, the first Iron Man for that's sure. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That first Iron Man is just it's really good, man. It's, it's still, and it's still good, it's yeah, still good. It's, yeah, it's really good. It's, it's really incredible. And it takes um, a lot for me to like Iron Man. I don't like Iron Man, like, 
and the fact that the movie made me yeah he was always one of my least favorite for sure yeah. Yeah. and then i'd say dr strange oh i knew you were i knew how did i know you were gonna pick dr strange yeah. i i thought i was like ooh, do i add dr strange I knew, I knew you were going to take that. I like Doctor Strange a lot more. Father, it's interesting. I didn't know you liked it as much as you did because I was like the one person that loved it as much as I did. I, I was crazy. like, I love this movie. I think it's fantastic. And a bunch of people were like, it's boring. I was like, I don't think it's boring at all. It. Like, I and um, I loved it. You know, another one I, you know, another one that was really good, unfortunately, um, politics and time has like really killed it. But I, I mean, I loved it. I don't really care what anyone says. I'm not trying to be that guy, you know. Um, but longtime fan, man, I loved Black Panther. I mean, it got played mm -hmm. out hard. No, it was good. It was a great. It was a great movie. I, I Black loved Panther it. was really good, yeah. man. I have to set all that stuff aside when I'm talking about the MCU. Like, I still want to see the Eternals, even though you can feel this whole like civil war erupting where it's like mm -hmm. people have just objectively being like, look, it's just not a very good movie. It's just not done. He's like, well, then you're homophobic because there's a gay couple in it or, mm -hmm. or like, or you just don't want superheroes that aren't white males. Mm -hmm. Like if you dare to criticize the Eternals and then it's mm -hmm. like, no, 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 no. It quickly like divided into like mm -hmm. someone. And then like these headlines are coming out like, despite far right like wing trolls eternals leads the box office for a second weekend in a row and stuff like that it's like it's got nothing to do with it like i put That's all an interesting it's an interesting takeover by the church of woke of even this like the alternate mythology mm -hmm. right so so you would think that and as it started, you would think that these would be like unassailable, right? To where it's like, nah, we just, how we're going to judge it is how close is it to the, to the comic books, mm -hmm. right? Like that's how we're going to judge it. How, how well does it tell the story? And now it's like, no, that's been captured too. One. Oh yeah. I mean, like it's the church of woke has captured that too, to where it's like, no, we've got to insert our, well, they're doing the same thing with the Lord of the Rings series. Huh? They're doing the same thing. What do you okay. mean? It's oh, they've wokeified it. I don't know what you're talking about. The Lord of the Rings series. It's I think it's on Amazon. It's from Hobbit. They're so doing a series. Hobbit, a Hobbit. They're going all the way through. Really? Starting with Hobbit. Yep. Yeah, and there's like there's talks about like the actors need to be okay with nudity and stuff like that. So yeah, it's like there's going to be like sex scenes and stuff for the first time in any lord of the rings what in the like, sam yeah. hill yeah yeah no it's it's buck wild man just hold on to your old intellectual properties and who they were to you a long time ago because they're all getting ruined i mean they're all just getting ruined so and that's not me being like oh superman's gay i mean yeah that sucks but it's like no it's it's completely different like comic book art the style the story writing that's superman wears a freaking mask to the hospital why does in the, su in the super in, in the, the superman comic books yeah what? yeah superman jr jonathan kent who by the way i looking back now five years ago in the comics this guy's like a 10 year old kid like and no joke like they've aged him and he's like gay now and he's like um he goes to the hospital as part of the story. Yeah, like super, super like uh, organic Tom Taylor to like put Superman in a hospital setting wearing a mask. It's like, why on earth would Superman need a mask? Because the coronavirus is bigger than Superman. Even Superman mm -hmm. cares. It can take down the man of steel, a full, no, he's not full-blooded Kryptonian. A man with Kryptonian blood in him can be felled by this disgusting virus. And it's like cold. Oh my gosh, dude. And so I'm sorry, I don't mean to rant, but no, Black Panther is a great movie. I love Black Panther single handedly in my top five or top three. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Favorite villains like Killmonger was a great. Oh, Killmonger was. Oh, Killmonger was yeah. Blew it out of the water. Maybe, awesome. maybe, the, maybe the best villain period in out of all the movies in the mcu arguably in my like mm -hmm. I michael love b jordan that. he he kills it you're really like you feel the pain 
Yeah. You really yeah. do. You're like, oh, this guy is, oh, he's for real. Yeah. He's for real. It's not comic booky with him. It's like, it's yeah, really you know, what's real. interesting too. You know, the interesting thing about Black Panther too was that there was a lot that was going on in there. I mean, it was a, it's a really, it's a really well thought out movie. And even some of the fourth wall stuff there, like not fourth mm-hmm. wall, because they don't really break it there, but like um, self referential. Like the nods, the nods, the nods, like forgive forgive me for being a buffoon and not knowing the term like for instance they bring up something i'm sure someone else has brought it up i don't really care to, like people get mad at me but like i don't i this is the first time i saw in a movie where they brought up the tension between african americans and africans yeah, i've never yeah. seen that before like that yeah and that's a real thing yeah. and the way oh, that yeah. it was brought up i was like because it was so central to the story in a way that wasn't Mm-hmm. cliche or like cringy it was like it worked with the story it was a wonderful underlying driving factor of the story and it dealt with it in a really nuanced honest way because nobody comes out looking great no one comes out looking nobody great. No, nobody every and, everybody's got problems i mean it was so well written and and that's why i go like i go like man that was like no, it was a fantastic. It just was really good. Political correctness, blah, blah, blah. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, Jack Kirby literally created the Black Panther because, yeah. like, we need more Black characters. That's right. And mm-hmm. so he was like, right. and God bless that man. Because God bless I'm, Jack Kirby, man. Oh, I can't say that enough. Like, yeah. Kirby is king. Really quick, I know this is like a, a just really quick, but Father, who's your favorite uh, Marvel villain? Oh, um obligation makes me say red skull because he's captain america's but i mean if it's not i love dr doom man dr doom he's really i really love he's the tyrant of a balkan country which is first off awesome and he calls himself doom he's so he is is he the smartest man in the world no or is tony snart stark it's not clearly defined within Marvel lore. In uh, DC, there are three of the smartest, Lex Luthor, Bruce Wayne, and I can't remember Mr. Oh, Terrific's name. Mr. Terrific. Yeah, Mr. Terrific. Is, and he's cool with being the third smartest in the world. Yeah. He's like, I'm cool see, with that. See, mine is Magneto by far. Magneto's a very interesting yeah, character. Good. By far. He's, he's, because, because he's like... He's sympathetic. You kind of get where he's coming from. Well, I get that, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like Doom though. Doom. Doom's just, awesome. The bulk. I like just like saying Doom. I know. I, mean, like, I would I, live, I would live in Latvia. Is it La- Latvia is no, the Latvia. Like, that's Latvia. the real one. Okay. No, Latveria. Latvia is the real one. His is I forget. Latveria. What it's it's Latveria. 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 Yeah. Latveria. Latveria. I always get it mixed yeah. up which one's real and which one's yeah. false. Doom. Doom. He's like for I am Doom. Yeah, it's just like that's, that's the that's <laughs> all you need out of a villain yeah. for I am Doom, yeah. and like the same thing with King the Conqueror. One of the reasons I love King the Conqueror is just like for I am King, and like yeah. the fist. Like every time he's like that last panel on the last page is just him going, I shall do this for I am King, and it's yeah. just like, oh my gosh, like yeah. screw any kind of like political overtones of like you need to make like a neo-nazi be captain america's like villain of course you need to that's 100 percent. yeah of course you do no it just need just have a mustache but like not even like not even mustache twirling because that like like a i don't know it's like a, a larger than life like ridiculous so over the top yeah like a harconian like a lynchin like lynch's yes, yes yes just yes so like just so like at no i point, will kill him i will <laughs> when dr doom can just stand there like oh, like fade. shooting blast while his arm is crossed and his cape is flowing behind him and he's just like you cannot touch doom it's just like this it. you don't need yeah. anything else than that but i mean red skull is pretty awesome too so anyway yeah i think we just hit two hours so yep. um uh oh okay so father um i don't know if you saw in the comments but maybe we could give just a couple minutes and i should have brought this up earlier because this does really demand a larger explanation so maybe we could tease it for next week or something like that have a week to pray on it and think about it 
but somebody talked about in the comment section that they are really wanting to go to church, but their church is doing the, the thing. They're doing the thing, mm -hmm. the bad stuff. And he's wondering, is it worth it? Should I still go? Even though I'm going to have to be complying with mandates and stuff like that. Um, should I still go to church? I, Cause I think I'm from, from what I remember he's exploring, like this is, it would be his exposure to orthodoxy. So maybe we tease it for next week. If you want to wait another week. Yeah, we'll uh, tease it for next week. And that person, if they want, they can try and get in contact with me. I'll talk with them. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. but yeah, we can teach it. We can. I got, I got some thoughts on that, you know, um, I really should have brought that up earlier in the episode, but yeah. that's fine. Whatever. We'll do, we'll do it next week. Fine. Or they can find a way to, if they contact us, we'll get them in contact with Father Turbo. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'm still not going to have anything ever. So that's that. Thank you. Have a good night. Oh, we have the email landing page. Other than that. All right. Coolio. Worldpath.network. Have a good night. Bye-bye.